Now, David Cameron's visit to China has proved rather fertile, quite literally, with a deal to send the Chinese £45 million worth of British pig semen. On a rather more prosaic note, the Prime Minister also hinted at an Anglo-Chinese agreement to work together on Britain's high-speed rail project at HS2. But despite the trade benefits, the trip has been criticised by some for downplaying China's human rights record. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, grabbed an interview with the Prime Minister shortly before he left China. For the last day of his trip, David Cameron travelled west to Chengdu in Sichuan province. It has ancient origins, a birthplace of paper money, something he and the business delegation with him have been chasing around China this week. He visited a local school and went to the home of the 9th century poet Du Fu. China's last prime minister complained on a trip to London that when he knew all about Shakespeare, the British were ignorant about China's entire civilization. So this leg of the trip is yet another effort to win favour with the country that will soon be the richest on earth. Just before he left Chengdu, I asked David Cameron about how he had conducted this trip. When you visited Sri Lanka recently, you pretty effectively, most people would say, shone a light on the abuses there in the north, taking the entire press pack with you to do that. You come here to a much more powerful, much richer country, and people might argue uh, you do nothing of the sort. I, I don't accept that. I mean, I think Britain's foreign policy should be one of engagement, that we should engage with countries and discuss issues of mutual interest, and that is what I was doing uh, in Sri Lanka. I come here to China, where one in five people on our planet uh, live, uh, wanting to make sure that Britain can secure our economic success by opening markets, securing jobs, securing investment orders, but also at the same time raising concerns uh, about human rights, as we do, not least through the human rights dialogue that we've agreed to restart. Yes, well that's, that's a bit of a sham really though, isn't it? I was talking to a minister who used to run it and he said the human rights dialogue was invented so China could marginalise the process of listening to people talk about human rights. It's a conversation that goes on in quiet between officials that are not of the top rank, where things are jotted down, also this minister said, and there has never been a concrete achievement recorded from it. Well, I don't accept either of those points. I think it's important that we have that dialogue, and actually there have been achievements from it. It's a way of sweeping things under the carpet. What are the achievements that have ever come from it? We list human rights abuses, and apparently nothing much happens. They, they say they might look into them and then nothing happens. Well, the point of raising these issues is not then to broadcast our, our brilliance on uh, Channel 4 or anywhere else, but it's to try and get things done, and I'm confident that that is exactly what we have done. But David Cameron used to be a Prime Minister who came to China and talked about how you can only have economic progress with political progress. You were accused in the old days of uh, uh, finger-pointing uh, by the last Chinese uh, Prime Minister. Here you're not finger-pointing, you're beating a drum for business, maybe even rattling a tin. Well, I'm beating a drum for business and I'm proud to do that because we've secured this week six, over six billion pounds worth of uh, orders, export services, uh, goods for the British economy. That means jobs back at home and that is part of my long-term plan to turn the economy around, to secure a recovery for all. So you've had a rethink. But, Why not just say? I, I, no, the, no, I don't accept that. You didn't no. want to do anything. As I said pointing. yesterday in the university, you know, we have different systems. We have some different values. You want investment from China in Britain and we've said to Huawei that they can come in. The Americans are much warier about them. Uh, George Osborne signalled that uh, you're interested in the Chinese 100% owning nuclear power stations. But this is a country where you've left your phone at home, served your entire team, you've come here without your laptops. Uh, trust isn't exactly in big supply, it looks like. Well, I'd make two points in answer to that. First of all, I think one of Britain's advantages in this modern globalised world is that we welcome overseas investment. We want uh, foreign companies to invest in our infrastructure to help us build the roads, the railways, the high-speed rail, the nuclear power and other power stations of the future. The more we do that, the more we can use the remaining firepower we have to add even more in terms of infrastructure that will help our economy succeed. There you are, you, you sign off checks for hundreds of millions to protect us uh, from uh, cyber attacks before you come here and then uh, stand there and uh, well, smile we, at but, the perpetrators. But we have, no, Aren't there no, risks no, to this? We have a proper system in the UK for examining whether investments into our country uh, are pro-competitive and whether they are in the national interest. We also have a very good 
uh, way of defending ourselves in terms of uh, cyber security. I think we're one of the most advanced countries in the world in terms of the action we're taking on cyber security, and I've made sure we put extra money this into This is the that. most advanced one at attacking us. Well, That's what I the say, intelligence services well, tell us. That is, that is, the point is, you know, is Britain investing properly in cyber security? Yes. Do we have proper systems to check whether investments into our infrastructure are in our national interest? Yes. Having said that, should we then erect political barriers and say, well, we have a system for checking whether it's in the national interest, we have cyber defences, but we don't want you to invest because we don't like the look or the sound or the feel. I think that would be a mistake for Britain. I think it's a mistake some other countries are making. Now, I want us to be the success story. I want the jobs, the growth, the investment to come to Britain. And you won't get that by saying, as some countries do, whether it's to Gulf countries or whether it's to China, I'm sorry, that investment is off the table. I don't think that's the right approach. When you get back, uh, the economy will be on the table with the autumn statement. Uh, you and the government generally have been going on and on about the cost of living since Ed Miliband brought it up. Uh, was he on to something? Well, the truth is this, that the only way to secure increases in living standards in a sustainable way in our country is to stick to our long-term economic plan that has involved difficult decisions about cutting the deficit, but is now paying off with higher growth, with more people in work, a million extra in work since I became Prime Minister. On some of these uh, areas, whether it's China, the cost of living interventions on things like the energy market, uh, green issues, uh, it sometimes sounds as though there are two David Camerons. Uh, are there? I mean, when people look for consistency, well, no, uh, they don't seem to find it. I think or, or is it just you change your mind a lot? No, I, I just don't accept that for a minute. I think when people look at this government, they can see that we have taken a very strong and difficult path in terms of the long-term future of this economy. You can accuse this government of all sorts of things, and people do, and of course, that's what happens in politics. But at the end of the day, people can see in 2010, we took some decisions about spending, about the deficit, about the long-term future of the country in terms of building infrastructure and making sure we could be a success story. The Prime Minister talking to Gary earlier.